In the last web lecture, we discussed the structure of the cell membrane, and we said that the structure could best be described by this fluid mosaic model of the cell membrane structure with this very fluid phospholipid bilayer embedded with these different proteins. And we talked a little bit about how the bilayer itself functions to make this membrane a semi-permeable barrier. So the phospholipid bilayer itself is going to offer some resistance to the passage of materials across it. And then we talked about how these embedded proteins regulate the traffic of molecules across this membrane. So this time we're gonna talk a little bit more about how these materials are exchanged between the cell and its environment and how this homeostasis can be achieved so that conditions within the cell can be maintained different from the conditions in the environment, how the cell can actually regulate its internal conditions. So let's start with passive transport. So passive transport is primarily due to diffusion of molecules, so diffusion of a substance across a membrane, and this is going to require no energy investment. This is going to happen completely spontaneously. So diffusion is the tendency for molecules to spread out evenly and fill up a particular volume and have a consistent concentration throughout that available space, throughout that volume. Although each molecule moves randomly, Division of a population of molecules may be directional, so we'll call this diffusion down a concentration gradient. At equilibrium, the molecules are still moving as much as they ever were, but at equilibrium, as many molecules are gonna cross the membrane in one direction as the other in a given period of time, and so we can say that there's no net movement of molecules at equilibrium. So let's take a closer look at how this all works. So we're going all the way back to the first week of the class uh, when we saw this slide before explaining that this will be a course about biological mechanisms. And I introduced a whole bunch of explanations for different biological processes that we really need to understand what those explanations mean here at the very beginning uh, before we go on. And one of those explanations was molecule X moves along its concentration gradient. This sounds very intentional, very directed. So how does this happen? What does this really mean? So what is diffusion? So diffusion is the result of the random movement of molecules. Diffusion is going to tend to homogenize the concentration of molecules in a volume. So that means they're gonna spread out um, and evenly uh, occupy the space so that their concentration is the same no matter what part of that volume or space you're in. And so molecules are gonna to tend to move from areas of higher concentration to areas of lower concentration. And this is what we call diffusing along a concentration gradient going from where the concentration is really high, as in the case of these red molecules here, moving over to the other side. The white molecules are gonna move along their concentration gradient where they're, from where they're most concentrated to where they're least concentrated until the concentration is even throughout. So why do they do that? So let's first think about the movements of molecules themselves. So the movement is random. And the reason they're moving, as we've discussed before, all molecules that have any temperature to them, any kind of thermal energy, are going to have kinetic energy um, due to this random motion. So they're going to be in constant motion. According to Newton's first law of motion, this is the law of inertia, each molecule will keep moving at the same speed and in the same direction unless acted on by an external force. So basically the rules if you're a molecule moving around in a liquid or gas is that you're just going to keep going in the same direction until something causes you to change direction or slow down or speed up. So most often if we're talking about molecules moving around in a gas or liquid, the force that's going to cause them to change direction is um, going to be due to collisions with other molecules. They're going to hit something else. And so when this happens, or, or they'll hit a surface, which is other molecules also, but when this happens, each molecule is going to ricochet off of the other at an angle determined by the angle of their collision. If you're taking physics, you'll learn um, about this in a more quantitative way, but basically they're just going to take off at an angle, so everything is moving around 
at random sort of like billiard balls. Okay, so we've got all of these randomly moving molecules that are gonna keep going in the same direction unless they hit something and bounce off of it. And so if we think about these red molecules and these white molecules that are separated from each other, when we create this permeable membrane between them so that they can move freely from one side to the other, if we think about the probability of a red molecule moving from this half of the volume to this half of the volume, it's relatively high, right? Chances are good that in any given period of time, at least one red molecule is gonna move over to the other side. The probability of a red molecule moving from the white side at that moment when that barrier is released, moving from the right-hand side over to the left-hand side is zero. Why? Because there are no red molecules over there. So we've got a high probability of red moving this way, zero probability of red moving the opposite way. And similarly for white. The probability of a white molecule moving from the left side to the right side is zero because there are no white molecules over there. The probability of white moving from the right side over to the left side is high. So as soon as these start moving and you start getting some red molecules over here, then you have some non-zero probability of red moving, and that probability is going to increase the more red molecules have moved from the left side over to the right side. At this point, you're going to have a net movement of red molecules to the right and a net movement of white molecules to the left. Keep in mind that at any given time, a, molecule, a red molecule can move in either direction, from left to right or from right to left, but on average there are going to be more red molecules moving over to the right and more white molecules moving from the right over to the left. Until you reach equilibrium, so this is after these have been mixing for a while, now if, if you have an even concentration on both sides, the probability of red moving from left side to the right side is going to be equal to the probability of a red molecule moving from the right side back over to the left side. Similarly for white, the probability is going to be equal moving in either direction. And so now you've got no net movement of molecules, even though the molecules are still moving from side to side, there's going to be no net movement. So when we talk about a concentration gradient, this is created by a difference in solute concentrations. So when a concentration gradient exists, there's a net movement from the high concentration regions to the low concentration regions. And each molecule is going to move along its own concentration gradient, regardless of the concentrations of other molecules in the solution. So as you saw, the white and the red uh, in our example moved along their own concentration gradients, regardless of what the other one was doing. So we can say that this process of diffusion along a concentration gradient increases entropy, it increases the amount of disorder. So when you have two things kind of sorted and separated um, apart from each other, you can say that that is more orderly than having them all evenly mixed together. And so because it increases entropy, it's gonna be spontaneous. It doesn't require any input of energy for this to occur. And again, equilibrium occurs when the molecules or ions are randomly distributed throughout the available volume. So molecules are still moving randomly, but there's no more net movement. We call this passive transport. Passive transport means that there's no energy required for the movement of these molecules. So when you have a concentration gradient that's going to move molecules from one area to another, we call that passive transport. So a special case of diffusion is a process called osmosis, and this involves water moving across a semi-permeable membrane in which the water is free to move back and forth across the membrane, but the solutes dissolved in that water are too large to cross that membrane. So water is going to move from regions of low solute concentration to regions of high solute concentration. Another way to think of this is to think in terms of the concentration of water. So if you think of the thing that's diffusing as being the water molecules, water is going from a greater concentration to a lower concentration of water, okay? So from a lower concentration of solutes to a greater concentration of solutes is the same thing as saying from a greater concentration of water to a lower concentration of water. So this dilutes the higher concentration of solute and is going to tend to equalize the concentration on both sides of the bilayer. So if we think of this in an experimental setup and we have our artificial lipid bilayer here in our beaker 
and unequal concentrations across the membrane, this is going to tend to cause the water to flow to the more concentrated side and you're actually going to have an increase in volume on this side. So this may not um, pr proceed until there are actually equal concentrations because there's going to be pressure from gravity from the difference in height of these two sides of the beaker that's going to be opposing that movement of water. So they'll achieve some kind of a balance between the osmotic pressure causing the water to come into the side and the gravitational pressure that is pushing down on the water and tending to push it back over to the other side. So this is an illustration from your book that really shows this idea of thinking about it in terms of concentration of water molecules rather than thinking of it in terms of solute concentration because it's, it can be easier to think of it that way because it then just follows the same rules of any other kind of diffusion. Here on this side we've got a lower solute concentration and you can see a much higher concentration of water molecules. In this case we're talking about a solute that is going to be attracting water molecules and so um, they're going to be water molecules hydrogen bound to these solutes. And so we think in terms of the free, the concentration of free water molecules. And the water is going to have a much greater tendency to move to the side with the lower concentration of water. So a helpful way to think about this in terms of living cells is the idea of tonicity. So tonicity is the ability of a surrounding solution to cause a cell to gain or lose water. So it'll have to do with the relative concentration of solutes. And it turns out that this is of any and all solutes. You can have lots of different things dissolved in the water, which is another reason why it's helpful to think of it in terms of water concentrations rather than solute concentrations, because it'll be the total number of solutes dissolved in the water. So the tonicity of a solution depends on its concentration of solutes that cannot cross the membrane relative to that inside the cell. So remember, we're only talking about large solutes that can't cross the membrane. And the concentration of a solution outside a cell may differ from the concentration inside the cell. An outside solution with a higher solute concentration we call hypertonic to the inside of the cell. So these terms like hypertonic are always relative terms so we say that the solution or the environment is hypertonic with respect to the cell or compared to the cell. A solution with a lower concentration of solutes is hypotonic to the cell and if solute concentrations are equal on the outside and inside of a cell we can say that those solutions are isotonic to each other. So now let's take a look at the effect these different conditions have on living cells. So the example we see here is for a red blood cell in an animal. And so first of all, let's look at an isotonic solution where the concentration is equal outside and inside the cell. So there will be no net movement of water. So here we see water moving in, water moving out at roughly the same rates. We can say this is in equilibrium. Water molecules are still moving across this membrane but no net movement of water. So in this case, the cell will have no tendency to either gain or lose water. It'll remain roughly the same size. So in this case, we're looking at the particular situation of cells without cell walls. So let's see what happens if we're not in an isotonic solution and we don't have cell walls. So in a hypotonic solution, water will tend to move into the cell by osmosis. Why? Because there are more solutes inside the cell, the water is going to tend to rush in to equalize the concentration inside and outside the cell. And this cell can, will swell, and if it continues to swell and take on water, it'll eventually burst, and we call the cell lysed. Lysed basically means the cell membrane has ruptured. In a hypertonic solution, water is going to tend to move out of the cell into the, the more concentrated solution outside the cell. So water will move out of the cell by osmosis and the cell will shrink and shrivel and probably die. The situation is a little bit different in cells with cell walls. So remember we said one of the functions of the cell wall was to prevent excess water intake of the cell. So same situation with an isotonic solution, no net movement of water and the cell size is going to remain the same. We call this flaccid, so this is kind of um, no tension on the cell wall, it's just kind of relaxed. And the plant may look 
if this is a plant, it may look just a little bit droopy, not quite plump and perky. In a hypotonic solution with plenty of water, uh, water is going to move into the cells by osmosis, and this will cause the cell to swell, just as we saw before, but that cell wall is going to prevent that cell from rupturing, and it will prevent the cell from taking on it, um, any additional water because the counter pressure from the cell wall is going to prevent, is going to balance the osmotic pressure of water coming in, just as we saw that balance between the gravitational pressure and the osmotic pressure in the artificial uh, lab situation with the beaker. This is going to prevent it from taking on any more water, and the cell will get nice and firm. And we call this turgid. This is a nice, healthy looking plant um, that's well watered. In a hypertonic solution, water is going to move out of the cell by osmosis. The cell will shrink. Um, if it gets really bad, the cell membrane will actually shrink away from the cell wall, and we call this cell plasmalized. When the plasma membrane pulls away from the cell wall, we call that plasmolysis, and so we call the cell would be considered plasmalized. So far, we've just been talking mostly about diffusion directly across the cell membrane, across that phospholipid bilayer. But diffusion can also be helped along by proteins that are embedded in that phospholipid bilayer. So in facilitated diffusion, transport proteins speed the passive movement of molecules across the plasma membrane. They're going to um, make it easier for these molecules to diffuse along their concentration gradient. So transport proteins include channel proteins and carrier proteins. We'll take a closer look at both of these. So channel proteins provide corridors. They're basically just going to be little tunnels for the molecules to, to go through. And they're going to be highly specific to particular molecules. So the amino acid residues on the interior of that channel are going to um, have characteristics in terms of their, their polarity, the size of the channel, that's going to make it very specific to whatever molecule it's there to transport. And so aquaporins are an example of a channel protein that facilitate the diffusion of water. So more or less water can be transported across the cell membrane depending on how many aquaporin proteins are inserted into that cell membrane. Remember these cell surface proteins can be added or removed from the cell membrane as needed by the cell. So ion channels facilitate the transport of ions in particular, and this is hugely important in many, many, many cell functions. It's going to play a big role in nervous system function, as we'll see later on this semester. And these ion channels can be gated. So in a gated channel, that channel can be opened or closed in response to some kind of stimulus. So this can be an electrical stimulus, or it can be some other molecule binding to that channel that will open it up. We call this a ligand-gated channel. And so when it's closed off, the ion that it's transporting cannot move through. But then when the stimulus occurs, then that channel is going to open up and the ions are going to flow freely uh, through that channel. So in this case, this is a voltage-gated ion channel. We can see that there's a positive charge um, outside the cell, a negative charge on the inside of the cell. When that reverses, so positive inside and negative outside, that's when that channel opens up. And this is very common, as we mentioned, in uh, nerve cells. The other kind of transport protein for passive transport is called a carrier protein. So carrier proteins are going to undergo a subtle change in their shape that's going to move that, that binding site across the membrane. So when, when the molecule binds, it's going to move the binding site that's going to translocate the molecule across the membrane. This change in shape can be triggered by the binding and release of the transported molecule. So in this case, we're looking at a glucose transporter. The transporter protein has a particular configuration that doesn't let glucose through when glucose isn't bound. Once a glucose molecule binds, that molecule is going to change shape, and then that change of shape is going to release the glucose to the inside of the cell and transport that glucose. When it releases, it's going to return back to its unbound shape, ready to bind another glucose molecule. And so this is going to be used to transport larger molecules, such as glucose, as opposed to the ion channels that are going to um, transport mostly very, very small 
um, molecules and ions. So lipid bilayers are only moderately permeable to glucose, but cells need glucose for their energy source. So in this case, a, a carrier protein named GLUT1 increases the membrane permeability to glucose. It's going to change shape when it binds glucose and allow diffusion along its concentration gradient across the membrane. So now let's shift gears and think about active transport. So what do we mean by active transport? What we mean when we say a process is active is that it requires energy for that process to take place. So this is going to use energy to move solutes against their concentration gradients. So this is the process that's going to allow those conditions inside the cell to differ from the conditions outside the cell. The concentrations of molecules inside the cell to differ from the concentrations of molecules outside the cell. So facilitated diffusion, which we just talked about using carrier proteins or channel proteins, is still passive because the solute is still moving down its concentration gradient and the transport requires no energy. Some transport proteins, however, can move solutes against their concentration gradients. Active transport requires ATP, hydrolysis, um, to move substances against their concentration gradients. All proteins involved in active transport are carrier proteins. They're always going to be involved in translocating those molecules across the membrane. And active transport allows cells to maintain concentration gradients that differ from their surroundings. So this is going to be that idea of homeostasis, regulating the conditions inside the cell within um, a narrow range of conditions. So one kind of active transport protein is a pump. So pumps are membrane proteins that provide active transport of molecules across the membrane. For example, animal cells have a much higher potassium and a much lower sodium concentration compared to their surroundings. And the reason they do is because animal cells have sodium-potassium pumps which use ATP to transport sodium and potassium ions against their concentration gradients. So let's take a look at how this works. So here is an unbound protein in its sort of default configuration with its sodium binding sites exposed. So three sodium ions are going to come and bind here once three sodium ions are bound. And then ATP is going to bind that's going to trigger binding of ATP and hydrolysis of ATP is going to trigger a shape change that's going to open up the transport protein to the outside of the cell and allow those sodium ions to be released to the outside of the cell. So we've got three sodium ions being released to the outside of the cell and this is going to expose potassium binding sites on this pump protein. When those sodium ions are released Potassium ions are going to come and bind to the potassium binding sites. We still have a phosphate attached here to the pump protein that was left there after the phosphorylation of ATP to ADP. When the potassium binds, there's going to be another shape change. That phosphate group is going to be released. This, the protein is going to open up to the interior of the cell and those two potassium ions are going to be released into the cell and this will restore the original configuration with the exposed sodium binding sites um, to the interior of the cell. So you'll notice that each of these sodium ions and each of these potassium ions have a single charge and that three sodiums are taken out of the cell for every two potassiums that are brought into the cell. And this creates what's called a membrane potential. So the membrane potential is the voltage across a membrane. So the voltage is created by differences in the distribution of positive and negative ions across the membrane. So remember that we were taking um, three positive charges out for every two we brought in. So that's going to create a difference in positive and negative ions across that membrane. So the cytoplasmic side of the membrane is negative in charge and the extra, relative to the extracellular charge, because remember we're taking out more positive charges than we were bringing back in. So for every two positively charged potassium ions moved in, three positively charged sodium ions are pumped out, more positive charges outside the cell than inside. 
We call this an electrogenic pump. That's a transport protein that generates a voltage across the membrane. So in animal cells, the sodium potassium pump is the major electrogenic pump. But in plant cells, uh, it's more common for them to use a proton pump, which is just going to pump hydrogen ions out of, out of the cell to create that voltage gradient more positive on the outside and more negative on the inside. And we'll see this used in many cases as we go through the physiology of cells. So, how do ion pumps maintain membrane potential? By moving materials against their concentration gradients, pumps set up what we call electrochemical gradients. So both a concentration gradient and a voltage gradient. We call that an electrochemical gradient. So when this gradient has been created, if channel proteins then open, these passive channel proteins, ions are going to move along their electrochemical gradients. What does that mean? It means they're going to respond both to the charge in the area um, that has become available to them, but also to their concentration gradient. So for example, in the case of the sodium potassium pump, for sodium, both its concentration gradient and the negative charge inside the cell are going to cause it to tend to move inside the cell from the outside. Because remember, it's being actively pumped out of the cell three at a time for every turn of that pump. So it's going to be more concentrated on the outside than the inside of the cell. And it's going to be more negative inside the cell. So all of that, both of those forces are going to tend to make sodium move into the cell. For potassium, however, the concentration gradient will cause it to tend to move out of the cell, but there's also a negative charge inside the cell that will tend to keep it inside the cell um, because of that attraction between the positive and negative charge. So it's going to have kind of conflicting forces acting on it. When both sodium and potassium channels are open, as the sodium moves along its electrochemical gradient into the cell, the negative charge inside the cell is gradually going to be reduced as more and more sodium, positively charged sodium ions move in, and eventually potassium will move out of the cell along its concentration gradient uh, because there's no longer that voltage gradient holding it into the cell. So these gradients, when they're set up by these pumps, represent potential energy. They're storing this energy in the concentration gradient. You can think of this like loading a spring or like um, pulling on a rubber band. When you pull on it, you're putting the energy into it. Um, but then when you let go of it, it's just going to snap to its normal conformation and, and do something. So this is what's going to happen with these concentration gradients, these electrochemical gradients, is we expend energy to just sort of load the spring to store a bunch of energy in this, which can then be released when we open those channels and things start to happen. So it makes it possible for cells to engage in what we call secondary active transport or co-transport. So ATP is not directly used to power the transport. It was used way back when we were setting up this electrochemical gradient. So co-transport is when electrochemical gradients power the movement of another molecule against its gradient. So let's take a look at how that works. So this is co-transport, coupled transport by a membrane protein. So co-transport occurs when active transport of a solute indirectly drives transport of other substances. So the diffusion of an actively transported solute down its concentration gradient is going to be coupled with the transport of another molecule against its own concentration gradient. So here's an example of a proton pump that's pumping a lot of hydrogen ions out of the cell, setting up a concentration and a voltage gradient, so an electrochemical gradient due to this proton pump. And then the co-transporter well, we'll let the hydrogen come back in, but only if it brings the sucrose with it. So this is the co-transport. It's going to use the, the passive diffusion, the passive transport of hydrogen ions to transport sucrose against its concentration gradient. And this is the primary way that plants can load up their tissues with, with sugars um, against their concentration gradient so that they're highly concentrated within the cell. Finally, the last method I want to talk about for getting materials into and out of cells is bulk transport of large molecules or large particles 
um, by exocytosis or endocytosis. So we've already talked about this process quite a bit when we talked about the uh, endosymbiont theory and we've talked about moving materials from the Golgi apparatus out to the cell membrane to release those contents out into the outside of the cell. And I'm just going to quickly review it um, because it applies here in this topic. So small molecules in water enter or leave the cell through the lipid bilayer or via transport proteins. So they're going to go more or less directly across the cell membrane. Large molecules such as polysaccharides and proteins cross the membrane in bulk via these little membrane-bound vesicles. So bulk transport requires energy to produce these vesicles and move the vesicles. I'm using motor proteins, as we saw in the last chapter, um, to a particular destination. The contents of the vesicles often need to be digested and broken down by lysosomes. Um, so all of this process requires energy. So. Let's look at the three forms of endocytosis. The first is phagocytosis, also known as cellular eating. And this is when some large particle, usually food, is taken in by the cell membrane. So this indentation is gonna form around the food particle that's gonna grow up and up and up until it completely surrounds this food particle, seals off the membrane, seals off this food vacuole, into a separate membrane. This is then going to fuse with a lysosome that's going to digest this food particle. Penocytosis is sometimes known as cellular drinking. This is basically taking in large quantities of solutes in one big gulp using um, little vesicles from the plasma membrane to just take in whatever is outside that cell in a fairly large quantity. Finally, there's receptor-mediated endocytosis, and this can be very useful when there's a really particular solute that the cell needs to take in for whatever reason. It can produce a bunch of receptor proteins that bind that particular molecule um, and send those out in one of those vesicles from the Golgi apparatus already bound to the membrane and put that on the cell membrane. Those receptors are going to attract that particular molecule that the cell needs and then once those have bound to the receptors, form a little vesicle again and take those materials into the cell. Exocytosis is just the opposite um, process where a vesicle comes and merges with a cell membrane and opens up and releases the contents into the extracellular space. So in summary, if we want to think about how things get into and out of cells from the very small to the very large, so small molecules, especially nonpolar ones, can just cross the phospholipid bilayer relatively unimpeded. So remember that this, the phospholipids themselves create some resistance to many kinds of molecules, but generally small nonpolar ones can get through. Proteins are going to regulate the traffic of other molecules into and out of the cell, and they're going to do this in a variety of ways. So channel proteins can allow molecules to flow along their concentration gradients, and these can be gated so they only flow along their concentration gradients when they're needed. Larger molecules can use carrier proteins, which change shape to transport them into or out of the cell. So this is very handy, um, as we saw with the glucose transporter, that will actually carry that molecule across the cell membrane. And we saw that the only way to have interior conditions that differ from the exterior conditions is to use active transport to move molecules against their concentration gradient. The examples we saw were the sodium-potassium pump and the proton pump. And we saw that concentration gradients, and electrochemical gradients in particular, can be used as a source of potential energy to create a flow of molecules to, to, do, some, to do something within the cell. And we also saw that ion pumps can be used to power co-transport of other larger molecules against their own concentration gradients. So they're going to set up a an electrochemical gradient for the ion, and then the co-transporter is going to um, allow the transport of the ion along with um, the other molecule that's being transported against its own concentration gradient. And then finally we saw that very large molecules, particles, or other organisms, smaller organisms, must be taken into the cell by endocytosis. There's no way for very large things to actually cross the membrane. They need to be actually taken up by the membrane and processed within the cell.